Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Nama Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Nama Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Sadhu 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 So what I basically planned for you all today was to work with a sutta, but at the same time, we're going to be learning something about words. After I started to plan the sutta, I realized probably Bonte's done this, I've done it, but then I thought, actually, that's a good thing because it's a sutta that you've heard before. And I was, I, I actually, uh, to be honest, I was so tired this afternoon, I fell asleep. And I had a paper to send to you, but I'm going to have to send it to you afterwards. So I'm going to have to walk this through, walk you through it this time with the paper that I have online. So we're looking at number 138, the Udesa Vibhanga Sutta, the exposition of a summary. And actually the topic that is in the sutta that I'm concerned with is two things. One thing, the sutta goes right to the heart of the matter of how agitation happens to a person, how you get agitated and irritated and upset and you start to go into the emotional stress and how non-agitation occurs. So that's why I used, wanted to use the framework. The second part of this though, outside of the hindrance, what you learn about the hindrance and hear about the hindrances again, the, the second part of this that um, comes up are words and how important words are. And after a number of years, I, there must be a way to give somebody a set of words that really reminds them about what all of you are learning. And most of you that are here, that I see now, are people who have been at least experienced enough to go into the first and second jhana and maybe into the first, second, third, and fourth. So when that's true, you're really, you're really going to start to understand this, all of this more clearly. And it's time for you to have little things to put in your pocket just to remind you here and there, um, wherever you are how this works so that it reminds you to keep watching it all the time and you've had dependent origination enough to understand uh, that you'll see the parts of the seven link chart happening in everything so what are the seven parts i don't know is there anybody here who who doesn't have the seven who hasn't seen the uh seven um, the seven link chart, is there anybody here that can tell me that they haven't seen it? Okay. The seven link chart starts with contact and then feeling. So it's fasa, then vedana. Then it goes into the craving, the tanha. Then into the clinging, the upadana. Then into the bhava. And we say your habitual tendency for reaction, your reaction library. And then it goes into birth, jati, but this birth is about the birth of your action in the situation or your reaction. And the untrained mind goes into the um, reaction, guaranteed just about every time anyway. And the person who has some training understands the opposite is to, with a trained mind, you stop and pause enough to decide on a response. And what your training is doing is eventually, hopefully it's taking you to where you are sensing it's not only wiser, okay, it's wiser, it's more skillful, but it's more comfortable in life to respond instead of reacting. Not only for you, but for the other people that you're working with and everything, it's, that's, that's the truth, that's real. 
So let's go into the sutta and we'll just go through and then we're going to come up with some words at the end that we can talk about. And um, there are some things that are going on right now. Um, I took, I want to tell the people who are here that, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for people that want to learn to teach if they want to pursue the practice. Uh, they have to do some things in order to be able to practice to be a teacher, but they want to do some online retreats, maybe more online retreats if they can't do them in person, to get them to a level where they're in fourth jhana there. They, they understand how to sit in fourth jhana clearly enough. They're balanced enough in their mind. And then if they want to learn to teach, then we start to work with them by understanding what it is that we are usually, uh, we are usually uh, going to, um, we are usually going to give us feedback to people who are having problems with meditations, different issues, different pieces of advice, how to go a next step, how to listen to the student to hear exactly what we need to tell you to do next. Because you're the ones that tell us if we listen clearly enough, we can hear exactly what you need to do to keep going deeper. And these are the kinds of things that you learn only by doing this a whole lot, your meditation, and then you're also not just practicing, but you might want to help someone else. And the way to start is to learn the order of teaching someone and attempt to do it with one person at a time. Uh, starting with being a mentor for somebody is great and sharing with them your advice with them to see how it helps. But then if you have someone who wants to learn and you think you want to mentor them and help them, one-on-one -on -one is the way, each one teach one is a good way to start. And then we're going to put together some um, information that I want to release that's been worked on for a number of years, it's never been released. And it's a um, sort of a, an index of all the suttas Bhante uses and the ones that we use the most in the retreats and the words that we use in the glossary and then a whole bunch of reference notes where the key pieces are in the texts. And we want to, to get this out to the teachers to use as their training. So that's what's going on right now. And I'm not sure when we'll do that, but I know there's going to be about 15 or 16 people involved in that. And then um, I, we probably cut it off at 20 people maybe, I don't know. Uh, but we, we have to make sure we have people that have the groundwork. They already have the, enough training. So if you're you know, interested in it, you let us know. Let Dama Gavesi know. He'll let me know, okay? Okay, here we go. So this is Majima Nikaya number 138 and is the Odessa Vibhanga Sutta, the exposition of a summary. Thus I have heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetis Grove, Anathapindicus Park, and there the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, Venerable sir, they replied, and the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, I shall teach you a summary and an exposition. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Bhikkhus replied, and the Blessed One said this, Monks, a monk should examine things in such a way that while he is examining them, his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor is it stuck internally. And by not clinging, he does not become agitated. If his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor stuck internally, and if not by not clinging, he does not become agitated, then for him, there is no origination of suffering. Of birth, of aging, and death in the future. 
So essentially it's saying there won't even be enough power to push through the universe, the consciousness to go into another being in some other lifetime. It's going to all stop and the circle, the cycle will simply, simply stop completely. Well, that is what the monk said. I'm sorry, the blessed one said, having said this, the sublime one rose from his seat and he went into his dwelling. And then soon after the blessed one had gone, the bhikkhus considered. Now friends, the blessed one has risen from his seat and gone into his dwelling. After giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. Now who will expound this in detail? And then they considered the venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher, esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life, and he's capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we go to him and we ask him the meaning of this. So once again, the monks are in trouble. <laughs> because watch what happens when we go to uh, over to, um, let's see, I have to get it for you. When we go over to see Maha Kachana, when he comes out to where the monks are, what happens first? It's very special. <laughs> the bhikkhus went to the venerable Maha Kachana and exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down on one side and told him what had taken place and added, let the Venerable Maha Kachana expound it to us. Well, here we go again. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't ask questions. The Venerable Maha Kachana replied to them, friends, it is as though a man needing heartwood, that means the answers, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of the heartwood, thought that the heartwood should be sought for among the branches and the leaves of the great tree that was standing, possessed of the heartwood. And after he had passed over the root and the trunk, and so it is with you, venerable sirs, that you think that I should be asked about the meaning of this after you pass the blessed one by when he was face to face with you and they were face to face with the teacher. For knowing the blessed one knows and seeing he sees. He is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma. He is the holy one, he is the sayer the proclaimer and the elucidator, the one that makes it clear of meaning. And he is the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. Tathagata is another name for the Buddha. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told you, so you should have remembered it. Surely, friend Kachana, knowing this, that the Blessed One has these uh, veneration, and he is the Tathagata, that was the time when we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning, as he told us. So we should have remembered it. And yes, the Venerable Kachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. The Venerable Kachana is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of the summary given in brief by the Blessed One without expanding, expounding the detailed uh, meaning. Let the Venerable Maha Kachana expound it with, without finding it to be too troublesome. So he had to do this, which is the tradition I want to explain for just a second. Because as a senior monk, when he comes out and the junior monks are foolish enough to have had the Buddha in their presence, and yet they didn't ask him to expound, they didn't ask him a question, this is where the questions become so important. 
for the way the Buddha was teaching, he came out and gave you the whole uh, conclusion and summary of everything precisely in one paragraph, didn't he? And then he didn't explain it. They should have asked the question. He would not have gone into his kuti at that time. He would have sat down and he would be teaching the lesson. All right, then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the bhikkhus replied, and the venerable Maha Kachana spoke to them. How, friends, is consciousness called distracted and scattered externally? Here, when a monk has seen a form with his eye, when you, the student, have seen the form with your eye, in, if your consciousness follows after the sign of this form, is tied and shackled by gratification in the sign of the form, and is fettered by the fetter of gratification in the sign of the form, then the consciousness is called distracted and scattered externally. Okay? Now, we got to make sure you all have all these words. I'm not sure if you do, but shackled means tied up. Uh, tied up and shackled is like putting prison chains on you. If you start to get attached to this form that you see, and the fetter, if you're fettered by a fetter of gratification, gratification means you see something that's very pleasing, and you start to get involved with it in your mind. And then the person's consciousness is called distracted and scattered externally with what is externally going on, okay? So this works the same way with the sound you hear with your ear, with the odor that you smell with your nose, with the flavor that the tongue tastes, and when you are touched by something with the body. Or when it, you cognize, you, you understand a mind object or thought with your mind. And if the consciousness follows after the sign of the mind object, it becomes tied and shackled. If it is tied and shackled to the sign of the mind object, or if it is fettered by a, the fetter of gratification. So the gratification, the pleasing is like the chain that goes around your foot, you're caught. And then the consciousness is called distracted and scattered externally. So now we're at 11. And how, friends, is consciousness called not distracted and scattered externally? Well, here, when a um, a student has seen a form with the eye. If his consciousness does not follow after the sign of the form, is not tied and shackled by gratification in the sign of the form, is not fettered by the fetter of gratification in the sign of the form, then his consciousness is called not distracted and scattered externally. Then if you are in that position where you're not pulled and caught by whatever is going on around you, at that point, your mind is clearer. And this is true with the sound of the ear or the odor smelt by the nose or the taste that is the tongue that tastes the flavor or touching a tangible with the body or with a mind object in mind. And if the consciousness does not follow after the sign, it is not tied and shackled by gratification in the sign of whichever sense door this is happening with. So we'll jump down to 12. Now, now what happens is we go into a little bit of path here. So at 12, we start talking about path a little bit. How, friends, is the mind called stuck internally? quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, 
The student enters upon and abides in the first jhana. So now we see that the student or the monks are practicing in their meditation. And as they're sitting in their meditation, now we're talking about when they're sitting in their meditation. In the beginning, this is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Now, the way we dealt with words with this, this is a good spot to show you. A lot of times people don't, when we sit in front of them and watch, I sit in front of them and watch their faces and he's teaching. If we ever used to say applied and sustained thought, people are sitting there scratching their head. What is an applied thought? What is a sustained thought? You see? And if we say rapture in America, this is, this is really difficult because rapture has to do with the Christians, with the apocalypse and the rapture coming and those who are good go to heaven and those who are not have to stay on earth or end up going to hell. So this is confusing. Using the word rapture is not a smart thing to be talking about right now today. But what it really meant was the, um, the rapture is uh, the kind of joy that is in, in the body happens later, which makes it so it's also inaccurate in a sense to translate this to rapture here. So what are we really talking about is in the first jhana when you feel the uplifted joy happen the first time. Remember, I tried to describe this to you. If you came to a retreat, they said, what, how do I know what uplifted joy is when it happens? And the answer to me, it seems to work with most people to explain it. You come into the interview and I say, did you feel joy? And you go, oh yeah. <laughs> and I'll say to you, What's it like? I, I, I am, I'm feeling really happy. But then I'll say to you, explain it. I can't. They can't explain it. So we come up with this, trying to explain it by saying this particular joy in the line of development is the first time you feel uplifted joy. It's a feeling of happiness, but you have no idea why you are happy. And it's lightness in the head. It's a light feeling of happiness. And then, and the pleasure born of seclusion. Now, the reason we took away pleasure was because pleasure is used in a sense all over the place in the suttas. But this is specifically what happens when joy fades away, you're sitting in the practice. Then, then what happens is happiness comes up. And this happiness is called sukha. Now, the Buddha, the, the, um, the, um, happiness has a reputation for being vibrational. That's like this in the world. The average person is like this, okay? And this happiness is very calm and quiet, and it's just contentment inside and you are walking around most of the day with a little smile on your face. That's about it. That's the kind of happy, and this is Buddhist happiness. Now, joy, if you haven't heard it before, I'll see if I can remember to do this the right way. Joy has five, five pieces, okay? There are five types of joy. And the first three types of these joy, anybody can feel this. Anybody, your families, you grow up with it. So the first one is, whoopee, we're at the carnival. That's kind of the first one, okay? That's the first one is like, whoopoo, you know, whoopee. Or the first one could be a really excited happiness because somebody came home after the war and they're alive and you didn't even know they were alive. You're just so happy. That's this, this kind of happiness. So this is open to anybody, okay? The um, second kind of happiness is like you are, um, you are, you are sitting in, um, okay, mm. you are sitting, you're playing in the ocean, you're playing in the ocean and the tide in the ocean is like mid tide. It's not high tide, it's not low tide, it's mid tide. So you're having fun in the ocean, 
but you have to keep watching out for the waves, but it feels really cool. And this kind of joy lasts longer. It keeps coming. These waves of joy are coming over you. Everybody can do that. They can also have that kind of joy. Um, the next one is where the lightning strikes you. The lightning strikes you and it's like, boom, and it lasts for a while. It lasts for a while. And it's something, you just discover something and you get really happy about the hope and everything and the confidence in it. And that's that kind of joy that, um, oh boy, I'm almost, okay. That's the lightning, right. And that one lasts for a little bit long. Whoopee is like there and it's gone. You see, it's like bang. And waves are like, waves are coming and they're just keeping you cool and you're not hot, but everybody else around you is. And that kind of lasts longer. It comes in pieces and the lightning, when it strikes, it lasts for a longer period of time than the first one. The next one is you're walking in the desert. It, you know, um, I know I'm messing this up, this is really funny. I usually know these by heart. I haven't done them in a long time. All right. The, what, the two, these three kinds are for everybody to feel. And then the fourth kind and fifth kind, the first one is that you are crossing the desert and you see uh, in the distance a um, oasis. And when you get to it and you get in the water, it's, it's like just right. And it's just around you and it's so soothing and it stays for a long, long time. So the fourth one, I'm sorry, was uplifting joy, but the one we said. And the last one was like in the desert where you come to the water and you get in and you're thinking it's going to be really cold, but when you get in, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. It flows all through your body. And we're talking about after the fourth jhana, when you're going into the mental states, this can come up. And just you feel this wonderful feeling but it's 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 something you have to be careful of you'll hear it in this sutta this is something pe people can get addicted to this and some people decided in the states to make up stories about you know this is what nibbana is we have to do this and what happens is these people when they're practicing they go home and they tell everybody leave me alone i want to go upstairs and close the door and be by myself because i have to have this joy and it's mine you see how possessive you can get but there's nothing wrong with enjoying these things if you understand what they are and your guiding piece of information is anicca these will always arise, be there, and pass away. If you take them personally and you want more, you will not complete the path. It's a very sad story. You will get addicted to wanting to have these happen like they're the perfect candy or the perfect food, and they're one step beyond that. The perfect me is what happens, and that's, that's like an addiction, so you have to be careful. Okay, that's enough of joy. So... If, if his consciousness follows after this, jo uh, this uh, joy and happiness that is born of seclusion and he, the person is tied and shackled by pleasure, the, the, hap the uh, gratification, they feel the reward in this joy and happiness born of seclusion, then his mind is called stuck internally. So this is what I'm saying. These last two, you, you can get, it's true, you can get stuck. The reason I'm emphasizing this like this is because on the history line of Buddhism, there was a period of time where jhana practice was totally forbidden. And we, we see now the residual of that, what's left from that. In some places, we find people saying, you don't want to ever practice jhana. And that comes from something that happened about 2,000 years back when people got, uh, didn't have correct instruction, started to practice jhana, and they got addicted. And we still have different schools today that still exist like that, only because they don't go back and read something like this, okay? Um, but the way out of this is to remember what? 
And every time I say this, you probably are gonna win $100 if you say Anicca. <laughs> Because Anicca, this is where Anicca might be the cause of suffering in one way, but in the other way, in your practice of meditation, I've discovered Anicca is the savior who is just sitting there to remind you, don't sweat it. Whatever's happening is going to pass away. Okay. Again, with the stilling of the thinking and examining thought, as soon as we say thinking and examining thought, everybody in the audience goes, oh yeah, thinking a thought or spending time examining it. Sure, I get it. And they know right away. So what happened here is we took synonyms to these words and kept testing them until we saw most of the people understood it right away. Um, they would enter and uh, upon and abide in the second jhana and here have self-confidence and uh, collectedness of mind. Now singleness of mind is the problem with that word. It's not a bad translation but when we have an outbreak right now of of concentrated, one-pointed concentration, one-pointed concentration, pr practitioners look at this as singleness means point, really hard. What does that do? Causes pressure here, causes pressure in the mind. So the person who does that way in the practice, maybe for a very long time, and maybe even accidentally will someday let go enough that they can fall into the first jhana. I don't know. But the only way into the first jhana is to let go and step back and open up and follow the instructions. So the collectedness is a better word because it's not as severe. It means bring together. And another way of describing it, the collectedness is a productive level of concentration. Okay, without thinking and examining thoughts with joy and happiness born of collectedness. If his co consciousness follows after this joy and happiness born of collectedness, then his mind is called stuck internally. So what they're pointing to here they're basically they repeated everything that was in the prior one if if you if his consciousness fall okay if it gets tied and shackled in gratification and in the joy uh, and pleasure then his mind is called stuck internally in 14 again with the fading away as well of joy the monk abides in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding, has equanimity, and is mindful. And if his con consciousness follows after the equanimity, even the equanimity, he will get in trouble if he starts to get caught by the equanimity, wanting it. There's always somebody who's gonna come into the interview and say, well, I did okay today, but I tried really hard to have what I had yesterday and it wouldn't work. <laughs> and as soon as you say that, I'm not sure what to do because <laughs> I always wanna go, well, I told you, you can never have what you just had again. Every single sitting, you have to get this into your head, is always going to be different even when you're working with determinations, when you get to that level where you're saying, I will sit no higher than something, okay? And when you get there, if it isn't the same way, you come in, you're disappointed, come on. <laughs> it, it's, you have to under remember this law. Nothing is the same. Tomorrow, it doesn't repeat. It's not all identical. It's all different. In his consciousness, he follows after this equanimity, his mind is called stuck internally. And again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, 
with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. Now in the third jhana, between the third and fourth, the middle of the third and the middle of the fourth, keep arguing about exactly where, but it's not always the same. You're gonna lose your body. You're gonna lose the feeling in your body. And how does it happen? Usually what happens, it starts with your feet and it starts with your hands. And then it creeps up your arms and legs and only get to your torso and just the whole torso disappears. But it's, if you're open enough to just experiment to see what happens, this is really fun because there's nothing left but this head sitting on a table. That's it. And there's nothing there except this head because you can't feel anything in your whole body. But what's interesting about this is if this is really um, proper and you finish the meditation and stand up to walk away, if it really was the equanimity and the, and the losing of the body the right way, when you get up to walk away from the sitting, you are absolutely free from any stiffness or soreness at all. It's fascinating to watch people get up from a three or four hour sitting and have them just get up and just walk away without any problem at all, you see? But in many, many cases, we don't see that. If we see the person struggling when they get up, we know they were trying too hard and they were trying to make something happen that was superficial instead of returning to nature and allowing themselves to just let go, okay? It has neither pain nor pleasure, purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. If his consciousness follows the neither pain nor pleasure and is tied and shackled with, by gratification, if they're hooked in on this idea, if they want to hold on to it, and uh, of this neither pain nor pleasure, is fettered by the fetter of gratification in the neither pain nor pleasure, then his mind is called stuck internally. And that is how the mind is called stuck internally. Okay. So the next thing we go at 16, we look at, this is the interesting pattern. We're seeing the pattern of the sutta. So he just presented to you how you get stuck externally, how you get stuck internally. So what has he shown you? He has shown you that what this lesson was about a form of suffering and what the suffering was, was to get stuck on things externally that you're involved in or to get stuck on them internally. So he's shown you this and he's also explained the cause of it. If you start to get caught in it and too interested in it, then you're going to be caught and not be able to move forward anymore. But now he's going to show you what? He's going to show you the cessation. So you see the, the Four Noble Truths in this? You see here's the suffering, here was this cause of suffering. Now what he's going to do is explain to you the cessation of the suffering. So how, friends, is the mind called not stuck internally? Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. And if his consciousness does not follow after the joy and happiness born of seclusion, and if it is not tied and shackled by gratification in the, the joy and happiness born of seclusion, is not fettered by the fetter of gratification in the joy and pleasure, of the seclusion, then his mind is called not stuck internally. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters upon, abides in the second jhana. And if his consciousness does not follow after the joy and, and happiness born of the concentration, the productive concentration level, then his mind is called not stuck internally. With the fading away as well of joy, the monk enters upon, abides in the third jhana. And if his consciousness is not, uh, does not follow the equanimity, follow it and try to stick on it, then his mind 
is not stuck internally. So he's showing you how you get stuck, showing you uh, that that's the suffering, how it happens. Now he's showing you how to reach the cessation of it. A monk enters upon, abides in the fourth jhana, and his consciousness does not follow the neither pain nor pleasure, is not tied and shackled to gratification in the neither pain nor pleasure, it's not fettered by the fetter of gratification in the neither pain nor pleasure, then his mind is called not stuck internally. And that's how the mind is called not stuck internally. So that's what he's done with you first. He's shown you the suffering, shown you the cause, and then he has shown you the cessation of it. Now, when to have the cessation, now we look at not how agitation happens and how non-agitation happens. So what's he doing? He's coming closer into daily life, isn't he? He's moving off the cushion and now he's going to apply it into where you can see how you could take this into every situation you have that you face. How, friends, is there agitation that is due to clinging? And what is the clinging? The clinging is the runaway mind. It's craving and clinging. It's not liking something or it's liking it in this story. It's liking it and wanting it and getting attached to it. And then the clinging is the story that runs around in your mind about why you want this and you want to hold on to it. How an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form or material form as in the self or self as in the material form. And the material form of his changes and becomes otherwise. With the change and becoming otherwise of the material form, his consciousness gets preoccupied with the change of the material form. Agitated mental states, born of preoccupation with the change. Preoccupation with the change is mental proliferation about of the material form arise to, together and they remain in your mind. Because his mind becomes obsessed, he is anxious, he gets distressed, he is concerned, and due to clinging, he becomes agitated. Yep. He regards feeling as self. He regards perception as self. He regards formations as self. These are all of the aggregates. He's going to uh, regard each one, get caught in the cycle of thinking everything I'm experiencing is part of me. It is mine. It is myself. And this is the personal perspective. If we believe that, we're going to live our life on the defensive to anything anyone says instead of remaining calm. That's what's going to happen to us, okay? And um, we get attached to it, trying to struggle with it, trying to make it stop. He regards consciousness as self or self as possessed of the consciousness. Everything that's happening, he believes it's me. The problem with this um, perspective, the personal perspective, is not only are you starting to believe everything that's occurring is happening to you, but also you, this idea of it's me, it's mine and my fault, my, myself, goes further on the line, so it must be, I'm to blame, and it is my fault. And then even that is carried on top of you now, 
it's all my fault. And as soon as we do that to ourselves, we are caught where? Well, we are caught in, uh, this is the little car, we are caught in the car that's already gone by. And these past things over here that happened, we put them in here and we're carrying them with us and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier until it cannot travel anymore. It's going to fall right off track. That's called a nervous breakdown. It's where everything shuts off inside. When everything shuts off inside, it can happen so seriously that when you do have the breakdown, you cannot even get up and walk. You have to use a bedpan, you can stay in bed and sleep. If you're smart, you go to the hospital to get through it because everybody else will think you're crazy and they're all gonna get mad at you, <laughs> you know? But it could go on for days after the power, the, the, the fuse box breaks. Thinking, talking, walking, reasoning, everything shuts down gone. That's a real bad breakdown. The, the consciousness of his changes and becomes otherwise. He takes his consciousness and turns it into a vengeful fight against what's personally part of me and is defensive and struggles. With the change and becoming otherwise of that consciousness, his consciousness becomes preoccupied with the change of consciousness. Isn't that right? So you change your consciousness. Now you're going to get worried that you change the consciousness and how you change it. It's going to compound on top of you. Agitated states of mind born of preoccupation with the change of consciousness arise together and they remain obsessing the mind. This is what's happening to the person. They can push them into a severe depression, but the answer to the depression, the most hopeful thing for a depression is to understand what's happening and that nothing is happening to you and there is a control command center and what it is, it needs the knowledge of how things actually work. Then the command center can actually start working your mind, your brain. Agitated states of mind are born of preoccupation with the change of consciousness arising together and they remain obsessing the mind. Again, because his mind is obsessed, he is anxious, he is distressed, he gets concerned due to the clinging, the holding on and grabbing on of this idea he wants to try to control everything, he becomes agitated. This is how there is agitation that is due to clinging. Remember the instructions for Bhante's, uh, for Bhante's uh, practice and the phrase in the book, when we look in the book and we see the phrase about, um, he says, um, let's see if I can find it. You do not want to try to, here you go, anytime you try to fight with the truth, anytime you try to control the truth, anytime you try to make the truth be anything other than it is, that is the cause of suffering. You look at what's happening in your life that you're struggling with. You say, am I stopping? Am I trying to do that? Am I trying to make it? happen a different way or make it be something else instead of going along with the current, the truth, the nature of it, which it will arise, be there and pass away. But you don't have to react to it. You don't have to be sucked into it. You know there's a way to purify and um, retrain your mind. And this is where your six steps come in. Because when it's coming at you, when it grabs you, when it's disturbing you, okay, you know you have a way out. Look at what it's doing. Okay, I'm letting that one go, relaxing, smiling, and I'm coming back. Look what you just did. You just purified your mind. And when you then, when you smiled and came back, you put in an alternative to the agitation. 
countering the agitator. We mustn't forget sutta number four. Sutta number four, for many people can help, many people like this one because the Bayabharawa Sutta is solving the disturbance, solving the agitation that is occurring by a system of embracing the contradiction. What do I mean? You know, on, the contradiction is off. <laughs> you know, off, the contradiction is on. <laughs> and, you know, the um, way this is working, when we look at this, this one, on page 103 of your Majima Nikaya, you look at number four, the Baya Barawa, and the solution he is using in that one to get away from the fear that the monk has, fear and confusion, and mental proliferation so that his, um, so that his, uh, whatever he's trying to do, he can't do it, his mind cannot become clear. And so he tries to fight it, okay? Instead of doing that or falling into fear in this sutta, the Buddha says when the recluses and Brahmins go into the forest and their covetousness and full of lust, they can't meditate. So I go into the forest uncovetous. You see what's happening? Okay. When you, with a mind of ill will and intentions of hate, if you go in the forest and you sit to meditate, it's not working. So what does he do instead? He sets his mind up with loving kindness. What is the game he's playing? You could do this with a group of children. You could have the different pieces written on objects or on the backs of bowls and put them on the floor and play a game with this. And you could learn the opposites the Buddha is showing you. You could, in a Sunday school class, you could do this because he's saying, when I sit, uh, other ones you sit with sloth and torpor and my meditation is not working, what should I do? You sit without sloth and torpor, means you bring your energy up and your interest up. You can put that one, okay. Then the, if you are having ref, restlessness, an unpeaceful mind, you, the counterpiece, what is the counterpiece? A peaceful mind. And if you're doubting how this is working or how we're teaching, then you go beyond the doubt and you follow the instructions. You let the doubt go, let it fall away, but you test the instructions. I didn't say to you, if you doubt this, to buy into the, the instructions and believe what we're telling you. I told you, if there's doubt that is consuming you and this and that and what to do, and you go back to the instructions, look at how simple they are and follow the, the instructions to find out what will happen. That's what I said, okay? And so you go in without doubt, given to self-praise and disparagement of others, then you decide not to give in to the self-praise or disparagement of others. You go in just to see what's happening with an open mind. If someone is trying to sit and they're full of alarm and terror from the forest, the darkness, the things that crawl and squeak and squeal, <laughs> I am free from trepidation. I'm going to sit there, he means, and accept whatever's happening as just being sound and just leave and put out the metta energy. That's it. Okay? So he has 16 things. It's worth going back to page 103. And it's worth looking at what this is and turning it into a game and play it yourself. Make a bunch of cards. And if you have the problem, what's the solution, problem, solution, problem, solution. It does support the idea of abandonment. And abandonment to me in hindrances is the key piece. Abandon it. Because if we go to 128, we have, uh, 11 or 12 conditions that are hindrances and the solution to all of them is to see that it is an imperfection of mind. What is an imperfection of mind? Anything that stops you from moving down the path and realizing how to get to Nibbana, to keep going, anything. Okay, it's an imperfection. So any of the hindrances that arise, any of them 
if, as his, his words were, when I see it's an imperfection, it's kind of remarkable because it I didn't realize it at first when I was teaching it, but the last page, yeah, the last page on 1015 of the uh, Imperfection Sutta, the Upak Palesa Sutta, he goes, the summary in that paragraph is saying, I understood that whatever it is, the doubt or whatever it was, is an imperfection of the mind. And he abandoned the doubt, which was the imperfection of mind, and proceeded to continue with his meditation. So he's talking abandonment. Abandonment is the key word. Not go and get the tank and find a big gun and get a bow and arrow and get ready for the war. Not pay attention to the hindrance and sit with it and, and, and try to figure out how to suppress it and subdue it and crush it and stop it and ignore it and everything else. I ignoring is okay, but you have to remember to put something in place of it. <laughs> you see, abandonment is okay. And what you put in place of it is coming back to your object of meditation. So all of it is about balance in the end. Okay, the last page here. We go to um, how friends is the non-agitation um, non due to non-clinging. How is their non-agitation due to non-clinging? A well-taught noble who has regard for noble ones is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma. Just means skilled and disciplined in your instructions for the meditation. Who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their practice. Does not regard material form as self or self possessed of material form or material form as in self or self as in material form. That sounds like a tricky little thing, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, you wanna play with it for a minute, May? Okay, we'll play with it for a second. All right, material form, it does not regard material form in self. So the material form, whatever the material form is you're dealing with is not part of you. And to see the answer of how they're talking about it in 148, we go to Chichaka Sutta. And he's, he's saying, let's look at that and see if you can see the answer if I just read that one section to you. Um, okay, in 148, uh, Chichaka Sutta, there is a section where the monks, got in trouble okay he's not self he says okay the lesson was the demonstration of not self but the monk's question was how did we get in trouble with this it's a very logical question how come we're in this icky position okay the origination of identity idea this is the way leading to the origination of identity he explains it to them straight up one regards the I thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards forms thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards the I consciousness thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards I contact thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards feeling thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards the uh, craving thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Now see, the thing about this is, this can't be right. So why is it that it can't be right? Because here's why. If anyone says the I is self, that is not, that is not tenable. The rise and fall of the I is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say the I is self and thus the I is not self. Now they're gonna do this with each part of it. The I, the form, the I consciousness, 
the eye contact and the eye craving. They're gonna explain it that way. And why is it true? Because think about it, okay? My eye, my working eye, sees a form. My eye meets the color and form. Eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is eye contact. With eye contact as condition, eye feeling arises as pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. Okay? And then with the feeling as condition, craving arises. But the thing is, as this whole event is happening, you notice that when you look at a rose, and like Deepa can look at the bell on the tree and when she sees the bell on the tree, she has a little tree there and she has the bell. When she sees the bell, after that's over, the sight is gone. The form the eye sees is gone. But you're not gone, are you? You're still sitting there. You see the logic in it? So he told them flat out, he's standing there in the forest with all of them sitting around him. Let's go through this whole thing, he says. And he takes them through the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind, proving to you that although this experience of sight, sound, odor, taste, or touch, or the thoughts happen when they pass away. Because why? Because of Anicca, you see? You are still there. So how then could it be, it's not tenable, it's not acceptable to say it is mine, it is um, myself, it is me, it is mine, it is who I am, it is mine. This is me, this is mine, this is myself. How can I say that? Because I'm still here, but that's gone. So therefore, I, I cannot be that. You get it? So when we go back to this sutta and 1077 at the bottom, it does this little thing that everybody hates. <laughs> you know, it's twisty turning. And it says, um, does, the Dhamma does not regard material form as being self or self possessed of material form or material form as being in the self, part of the self or self as material form. And it doesn't accept feeling that way and it doesn't accept perception that way, and it doesn't accept thoughts this way, and it doesn't accept consciousness this way. You see that? That's how this is working. So it's proving, he was proving it in a line of deductive reasoning and logic. He wasn't just saying it to them, he was proving it. And he was, when in 148 later on, before the end of this book, he takes them on the trip of the Chichaka Sutta. And we might do that and examine it one time. Um, it's an hour to do it, but it, um, then you go. But what I'd like to do with you maybe when we do next week, we can do it, is to explain the pieces of the Sutta to you, to send you the Sutta and send you the summary page of each of the sections in the Sutta and then you can have the cue sheet too, if you want to play with it, you can try to memorize it. It's not hard to memorize because it's a very short sutta, but you say it six times because there's six sense doors, that's all. It's not like some of them are very hard to memorize, but this one has one set of information and sounds magnificent because it's so long, but it's just the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and mind, you see? All right, so this last section, agitated mental states are born of preoccupation with the change of material form. So you get agitated when you're doing something, seeing something, and it's over, you're agitated, you wanted it to keep going. It's simple, okay? And they remain obsessing your mind. In other words, here's another case of this. Here's a little, here's a little car. I should have a red car. I got to find a red car. Okay, here, we can use this. Um, that's too big. 
you need a Volkswagen here. Here's an eraser. This is your car and we're back here and we're driving this way. And when these things are happening behind you, the secret is leave them alone. And once they're finished, let them disappear. Okay, don't take them and pile them into the trunk of the car. And then the car can hardly drive down the track and keep going through life. Okay, but let the little car move through life with you in it and allow you to have all the power and potential of your mind and your abilities to work on what you're doing in the present moment. That's what you're trying to do. So this little example of the car, don't put this stuff in the trunk. Let it go and don't put worries into the front of the car. It's going to go like that. It's not going to be a smooth ride. Because his mind is not obsessed, he is not anxious, He's not distressed and not concerned. And due to what? Due to not clinging, he does not become agitated. Now, when people do not have knowledge of dependent origination, we read this as, and due to non-craving and non-clinging. No craving and no clinging. Why do we do this? Because they don't know about the conditional relationship between the craving and the clinging and the habitual tendencies. And so we realize when we find these in the suttas this way, that the Buddha is speaking to a group of monks who are very, very familiar with the dependent origination and the seven link chart. And they're watching it all the time in their practices. So they're very familiar. The point is, you can't stop clinging unless you stopped craving. You understand that because craving is with con craving is condition, clinging arises. You see, you get it. So when we're talking to a group of people at a university or someplace, and we, we will always say craving and clinging, that's why we do it. He does not regard feeling as self. He does not regard perception as self. He does not regard formation as self. He does not regard consciousness as self or self as possessed of consciousness or consciousness as in self or self as in consciousness or consciousness of his changes and becomes otherwise with the change and becoming otherwise of the, of the consciousness, his consciousness is not preoccupied with the change of the consciousness. So what's this telling you through this whole paragraph? Agitated mental states born of preoccupation with the change of the consciousness does not arise together and remain obsessing his mind. Because his mind is not obsessed, he is not anxious, distressed, or concerned and due to non-clinging or non-craving and non-clinging, okay, he does not become agitated. This is how there is non-agitation due to non-clinging. So this is the end of the lesson. Basically, he's telling us all, never mind. <laughs> Put yourself in your seat, do your meditation, Never mind the future, never mind the past. If anything comes up, are you from the past? Go ahead, I'll see you later. Are you from the future? Okay, I'll see you later. But right now, I'm here in the present time sitting. Nothing can touch you, you see? So this is a practice of understanding how to get to still point, still point. Do you remember me telling you about still point? Do you guys remember me talking about still point? Okay, or clear mind or still point, okay? Um, pure mind, pure mind and still point can be seen as a real place. And what it proves when you notice this in your practice is you are looking at confirmation of the state of cessation. So if you were, um, just go here for a second. 
if you're going to recognize that you are slipping into getting concerned about one of these things that's in the sutta and you release and you relax and then you smile as you return and you repeat as needed. Repeat is sort of a dead piece of this. I mean, you're just asking yourself to repeat the cycle, repeat this cycle, okay, again and again, you know, like that, to retrain the mind, but only to repeat as needed. That's the key to this. Not every thought that comes up needs to be kicked aside, only the ones who are trying to interrupt you. Here's where this happens. It's right. Um, it is right, it is right here, whoops, right here is still point, pure mind. Bhante calls it pure mind, David calls it still point. Um, they had a place called Still Point in California before they came to Missouri, that's why, okay. So this, this is um, essentially cessation of craving. If you're doing these steps correctly, you are releasing by just letting it go, and then you're adding this relaxed step and then right there, there is no craving, no craving. That's what this is. So what does that mean if it's no craving? It is cessation state. Now, if you're sitting deep and you wa want to watch this, when something comes up and you do your 6R, just watch very closely, very quietly. And you might notice this really, 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 really empty, clear spot. That's what still point is, okay? That's where it is. And yes, we can see it. So we're gonna erase this out. And the end of the sutta is a wrap up that is normal in the sutta in this one, okay? Um, right, okay is normal to end the sutta, but we'll read it to you. Friends, when the blessed one rose from his seat and he went, he's scolding the monks one more time, just for good measure. <laughs> when the blessed one rose from his seat and went into his dwelling, after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, a bhikkhu should examine things in such a way that while he is examining them, his consciousness is not distracted and scattered externally, nor is it stuck internally. And by not craving and clinging, he does not become agitated. He doesn't hold on to anything. And in his, if his consciousness is not distracted, and scattered externally nor stuck internally. If it is not clinging, he does not become agitated. And then for him, there is no origination of suffering or any more of the birth, aging, and death in the future. I understand the detailed meaning of the summary to be this way. Now, friends, if you wish to go to the Blessed One and ask him about the meaning of this, as the Blessed One explains it to you, so you should remember it. And then the monks, having delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Maha Kachana's words, they rose from their seats and they went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told the Blessed One all that had taken place after he had left, adding then, Venerable Sir, we went to Venerable Mahakachana, asked him about the meaning, and Venerable Mahakachana expounded the meaning to us in terms and statements and phrases this way. Mahakachana is wise, bhikkhus. Mahakachana has great wisdom. And if you had asked me 
the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in the same way that Mahakachana has explained it. And such is the meaning, and so you should remember it. And that is what the Blessed One said, the bhikkhus were satisfied, and they were delighted with the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So, that's the first part of this. The second part, I will um, show you how I, how do I do this now? Let's see, it should be here on the screen, right? Yep, okay, here we go. This is what I'll send to you. What this is, it's time for you guys, you're probably doing it on your own, but we're just gonna share something with you. Um, I'm always looking for ways to let a person see very quickly and remind ourselves very quickly the words and phrases that are actually interwoven and these things, uh, when they're activated, the words by the practice cycle of TWIM, they, they carry and pull together the meaning of everything perfectly, just to remind you, you know? So one of the things that I came with, up with a while, a while back was, um, we have so many terms that are basic things like these words, but what happens is, there's so many different definitions floating around, okay? And we want to make sure that you understand how we're determining these words. So there's six words that really do teach us the Buddha Dhamma and remind us of exactly what we're doing when we're practicing our meditation. The first one is to remember the function of meditation. The purpose of our meditation is to observe the movements of mind's attention in order to see clearly the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, and the three characteristics very, very clearly, and how they're interlocked, how they're interrelated with each other. And because they are, that's what shows us how everything works. And the meditation is how we're going, how the Buddha discovered it. So this was his instrument, you might say. The mindfulness, the sati, for us is the actual doing of this observation. The meditation was one thing, but making it happen, the mindfulness is the locked in piece. This meditation and mindfulness are conjoined in a way where you can't meditate without proper mindfulness. And proper mi and mindfulness doesn't carry you anywhere unless you understand the purpose of what you're doing. We see this clearly. With the mindful, with, the, with some of the developments, in, uh, developments outside of Buddhism in mindfulness, we see how they are temporarily helpful, but they don't really continue to solve long distance problems for a long period of time for most people. And that's what we're interested in showing the simple way of relieving your suffering, okay? So the mindfulness, it first of all, it reminds you what to do, and that's the six R's. Six R's falls under the mindfulness. So let's look at this. The third one is delusion. Delusion is the false idea, the consequence of, it's, it's the false idea of an independent self. And it's, the pro it's actually interested, what the teaching is talking about, is the consequences of totally embracing that idea without considering anything else. And what happens when you're deluded is you, you take everything too personally, but you can go beyond that and see how everything's actually working and watch it without the delusion. That means change your perspective to less taking things less personally. The craving, we know what the craving is, the purification of mind. The reason we're doing the whole thing is to purify our mind and then also after purifying it, we want to retrain it. So real quick, what's happening here is they fit together like this. 
observing the movements of mind's attention to see clearly the four noble truths, the impersonal process of dependent origination, and the three characteristics. Well, that was 25 words. We had fun with this. We got down to eight words at one point. You're observing the true nature of everything. That's the smallest one. Six words. That's what the point of the meditation is. Observing the true nature, how everything works. At any rate, it's clear that the meditation was training people to observe how things work in a very precise way so that they could see for themselves how we experience our existence as a sentient being. So the study of human cognition by paying attention to this process reveals how feeling happens, how emotions evolve, how they get bigger, how we hold on to them, how they cause trouble, the agitation we just talked about in the sutta, and finally, how they fade away in the very same way every time, if we don't give them nourishment. So we are using the meditation like a microscope. Think of it as a microscope, which allows you to see how suffering happens in life. And it makes sense that you can't change your behavior or fix anything unless you really know how it all works to begin with. Meditation is the instrument through which you can get to watch this happening. So what is the mindfulness? Is the actual observation skill, different kind of observation and has a tendency for remembering or recollecting first we keep this observation going all the time, it reminds us to keep it going while we're living, while we're working all the time. Number two, it helps us remember what to do if we are pulled away from continuing the observation, which is 6R. So the mindfulness is the principal support for meditation to take place, and the two are totally interwoven. This kind of observation leads us to, the discover, to discover our ability to recognize and release unwholesome habits and bring up new and wholesome habits instead. And we get to watch closely the consequences of both unwholesome and wholesome mind states at their root. We get to watch at the root. Mindfulness is very important because it keeps us watching. It's the one thing that keeps you watching, reminds you to do all the steps. It helps us become a watcher. And without meditation training, a person's mind is often scattered to the wind. When beginning meditation practice, one of the first steps is reeling in mind and asking it to do one thing at a time that seems impossible, but this exercise can be an important exercise. Until now, mind believed that it could just jump around like a monkey in a tree. But now you're asking it to move in a direction that you lean into. You don't force it, but you lean into it as you're training the mind. You are asking it to follow your mental inclination. You don't do anything forcefully. Mind just learns what it means when you incline it in a wholesome direction and it begins to respond if you repeat it the same way every time. If we do this correctly, it leads to a naturally just walking, just sitting, just eating. And all of this is good to calmly observe happening one thing at a time. But we should not get overly involved with that kind of observation because it is simply one step in the process of development. There's more. We now begin to watch more inwardly what kind, what mind is doing while I'm walking and what is my mind doing while I'm sitting, while I'm eating, while I'm driving the car. So we've taken it one step up, what is mind doing while I'm doing this action? instead of watching the action itself to get the same result. Within the text, the Buddha trained the monks to notice how everything works during the process of human cognition. We know there's 86 suttas in the Samyutta Nikaya in the Nidana Waga, the book about dependent origination. 
but it doesn't say to concentrate on this very, very hard, the process of dependent origination reveals the answers to all our questions, but for now, it's a topic for another day. We, we talk outside of this, but we're, what we're after is to question and then begin to observe and how do we experience our existence um, both internally and externally, like in the last sutta. We begin to watch and we begin to see and take notes after each sitting about what is happening. And externally, we see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. Internally, mind experiences it as a deeper level, dealing with arising thoughts as well. During meditation, the student secludes himself from his external sense doors by closing his eyes, secluding the sense door of the eye. He practices letting sounds go because a sound is just a sound, so let it go. He lets go of odors, of tastes in the mouth, sensations in the same way. And they're just what they are, they're nothing more. He goes beyond now to observe the movements of mind's attention. And what does he learn? What is delusion? Delusion is the important word because it's the false idea or concept of a self. And as I said, in respect to the teaching, he is basically interested in you not going to the extreme where you take everything, the consequence, the consequence of this idea of a self. It isn't that you should disappear or your personality is no good or anything like that. It's not like that. And you don't have to shut down an ego to be a Buddhist. This is not real. It's just that he was interested in the consequence in relationship to suffering if you were so self-absorbed and selfish and so totally involved in self, what would happen to you in suffering? This term is a little tricky because it's one of the examples that confirms we cannot define what it means within Buddhism if we rely on a normal dictionary. This is one of those words. And so although saying that this means the false idea or concept of a separate self is correct, we must be more concise when we're using this word in Buddhist practice. So it's actually the consequence of the idea or the concept of a self or no self that is our real challenge. Understanding the consequence to our actions is the most important part if you wanna change. It is not our self on a conventional level that is the problem in conventional life. This idea of self, which we've embraced while growing up, has led us to take everything in life very personally. And so this then becomes a spark that ignites the craving. And this craving is our real problem. And when it comes to suffering, everyone tells us that craving is the cause of suffering. To give up craving, the student must first see what is by, it is by understanding that it happens because of the consequence of the false idea of a separate personal self. That's why it happens. Craving doesn't just occur. Someone must crave for craving to be a problem. One cannot have an opinion such as I like it or I don't like it without a self being involved, right? And so we see the need for a pronoun I to activate a verbal action in the word crave. This craving is also progressive. First, I like or I don't like, progressing further into I want it or I don't want it. And so this I, this personal aspect, has a driving kind of energy behind it. The Buddha urges his monks to try to solve the effects of this in 148. We already talked about this today. This is not me. This is not mine. Or this, they say the problem is this is mine. This is who I am. This is myself. But then 
for the monks to do this, that it's just not something you just listen to. It's something you take out and you practice. This is not mine. This is not who I am. This is just what it is. Again, we're looking for what is essential and what is unessential. And it's unessential to take it on personally. It's essentially just what it is. When we practice this exercise, we realize that the opportunities were missed during social interactions during our day because we took things too personally. And we got on the defensive when we didn't have to. And what if nothing had been taken personally in that same situation? How would it change? Can you imagine what would have happened if you only observed what was essential and not what was unessential? What did you act upon? How would you have acted without the personal aspect involved at all on your side? How would things have been different? Maybe impersonal, creative, peaceful solutions could have come up into your mind. Maybe a different outcome would have occurred. The Buddha left nothing out of his training, and it's, it's really fascinating because of all the stories he left with us. But we begin to see this dilemma about this idea of self because one only needs to review a day in retrospect to consider how options as the first step to really understanding what Atta and Anatta are about and what can you discover? What situations could have changed if there was no personal angle from your side involved? Can I see when I review this day what I personally thought, what I personally wanted? How many times did I think but what about me? Did you notice where the I always do this or that in this particular way? Did you remember that I did not like, did not want something to be the way it was? Play the day through in your mind again, now, without you or them in there and see if you can identify what was essentially going on in that event. Now, how different does it look? What is craving? This is without, without um, delusion, craving can't exist. And this should be rewritten because craving can't exist without delusion. This is an interesting point about studying Buddhism because I cannot tell you what craving is precisely then if I can't do that, how can I tell you how to let go of the cause of suffering? I can't. And so you must have a clear definition for craving that is useful to remember. The question is, can we specifically identify craving? What if we can? We can show you exactly what it feels like and how it works. What if we use a definition for craving that goes like this? Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in both the mind and the body as it is arising. And it is the I like it or the I don't like it mind. This is what we drill into our minds to remember automatically. And this arising tension indicates the first obvious personal opinion about what is happening. It is consciously occurring in the steps of human cognition within our body and our mind. Before this point in the line of human cognition, there is no obvious personal nature causing suffering. So initially in your training, it is most productive to consider the impersonal nature of the previous links of your cognition leading to the link of craving as only being part of the natural function of the human body. Consider that I don't make an eye to see. I just, it just sees as a functioning organ in the body. And this is only an organic operation going on with the eye and the vision optical system. Nothing personal has happened. Take a look. 
And then this gives you an example that we use all the time of the rose and talks about that. The end goal of the meditation is to see what life can be like without tension and tightness in it at all. If we just let the process of dependent origination or human cognition happen, and we naturally watch it without any suffering. It can only happen if we have knowledge about uh, how this is happening when we attempt to lovingly accept the present time as it is happening. We are joining in the flow of life. We stop trying to personally change the truth of the present time to what we want to make it be instead because fighting with the truth always leads us to suffering so without the tension of suffering it's like there's a zero pressure point no torque for the engine torque is the power that pulls the engine that turns the wheels in the engine torque is the word in engineering for the pressure needed to turn a wheel in a machine in this case, we're turning the wheel of suffering. Without torque, the wheel of suffering slows down. And that's what the meditation is all about. So what would it be, we'd be left, what would be left here if, if there was no pressure at all anymore? This is what the Buddha wondered, the, the Siddhartha wondered. Would mind then exist in a more spacious, relaxed environment. What would be the potential of a mind without pressure on it? Could it possibly come up with peaceful solutions for everything in the world? It opens up an interesting potential idea, doesn't it? So how can we change mind? Habitual tendencies and how can we change the behavior? Can this happen? We go to the next word, it's purification. Purification of mind is a process in Buddhism that happens when we let go of unwholesome mind states in life and embrace new wholesome mind states in place of them. Once tension and tightness is released, we can relax our head and mind and work on purifying mind. We must understand that a wholesome mind state and an unwholesome mind state is to begin with just like we needed to know what craving actually is. So the Pali words akusla and akusla clearly appear in reference to this discussion. We are taught in the text, if something is wholesome, it makes life easier and the hindrances do not come up to disturb the mind so much in life. Wholesome mind states lead to happier, more contented periods in life. They help create a calmer, calmer environment to live in. Wholesome states can be found through the development of forgiveness, compassion, loving kindness, appreciative joy, equanimity, and the attainment of knowledge and vision, which encourages you to continue to develop Buddhist wisdom. Unwholesome mind states are just the opposite. The five hindrances themselves are a basic view of unwholesome mind states. The five basic hindrances consist of greed and lust, hatred and aversion, sloth and torpor, restlessness, guilt and remorse, and doubt. And these are what I call the karmic kickback or kamapala, the fruits of actions. These do not only come up to bother us in meditation, but when you're out not doing meditation, they come up and bother us in life too. And so the idea of purification of mind to learn how these hindrances work, eliminate them by outsmarting them. We have to learn how do they continue to exist? What makes them bigger, stronger, and last longer? Is there a way to counter them in the meditation and in life? There is. By just letting these hindrances be, when they come up, they will begin to fade away. 
And this means don't get involved by personally thinking about them. Then we must remember that we cannot leave a vacuum when we let unwholesome mind states go. We have to replace them by embracing the wholesome direction instead and keeping that quality of mind going. And this is how mind gets retrained. In fact, the objective is to outsmart the hindrances to overcome them. We do not have to fight them by understanding our personal attention is their nutriment and letting them go. We defeat them. Indeed, now that we know mind's attention is their nutriment, by moving this attention solely in the direction of remaining retraining mind in your meditation practice, you will be embracing the most wholesome state that you can, and you will become, they, uh, they will become abandoned. So the retraining of mind is something that happens in the six R's. I don't need to go over this. I need to just ask you if there's any questions now. Uh, but this retraining of mind happens through TWIM. The bhavana practice is the development of your mind. And then there are some notes down here at the bottom. And I will send this to you guys through Dhamma Gavesi. You'll all receive it, okay? And um, let's see, we go back out here, stop share. So um, I've been rambling on for a while. So now, does anybody have any questions about what we're talking about tonight? Yeah. Wait. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find release. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.